military complex. A look at Egypt, Jordan, and the UAE. Um, is this okay volume-wise? Okay, great. Um, first, thanks to everyone for coming. Thanks to, uh, do you call it CCAS? Or do you say CCAS? I don't want to mispronounce the acronym. Um, and Dan, uh, Daniel Lee for inviting me, and also Elizabeth uh, Sexton for organizing everything and for blowing up that picture of my head so large <laughs> on the uh, event announcement. <laughs> that was beautiful, thanks. Um, so yeah, so tonight I'm going to talk about uh, the globalization of defense industrial manufacturing and the new Middle East military complex and look at the cases of Egypt, Jordan, and the UAE. So uh, globalization and the deepening of the capitalist mode of production have produced really dramatic changes in the global arms market. But what concerns many defense firms today is not the arms trade, per se. As Stephen Brooks points out in his book, Producing Security, trade is really a second-order phenomenon. Where and how multinational defense firms actually organize their production activities, which is to say the nature of the military-industrial supply chain, is now a key factor for firms operating in the global arms industry. And although political economists and historians have long argued that defense would be the last industry where production would be outsourced, we have finally arrived at that historical juncture. Outsourcing and subcontracting are elements of economic globalization that, of course, have proceeded apace for centuries, but were, for the most part, restricted to coordination among firms within the same state. So the rise of international outsourcing and subcontracting that occurs across borders only really expanded dramatically in the latter half of the 20th century, and the realization of these trends in the defense industry specifically really began in earnest around the 1980s. This has created an arms market that is increasingly composed of defense firms that are multinational or even a-national. These firms lack strong ties to a single host government and as such are increasingly untethered from the strategic and political imperatives of nation states and instead increasingly responsive to the financial interests of their shareholders and company executives. The reason that the Middle East is a critical node in the expansion of the globalization of defense production really has little to do with the traditional factors that we associate with firms and their desire to outsource. Such factors would include things like low labor costs and less stringent environmental regulations. But the move to produce the weapons of multinational defense firms in factories inside the Middle East has more to do with the way firms have responded to the relative decrease in procurement budgets in the US and Europe, which has been to incentivize their export deals by incorporating novel purchasing incentives and sophisticated financing arrangements that are designed to appeal to potential clients. Mm -hmm. Dramatic pause. On the receiving end, governments in the Middle East are seeking to capitalize on their status as the world's most lucrative regional arms market by shaping, by reshaping the nature of state support and subsidies for defense manufacturing. Regional governments have taken a range of actions intended to make themselves more attractive locations for arms production. They have provided upfront financing to firms to develop next, to develop next generation weapon systems, which the firms can then sell on to other third party customers. Uh, these governments have also constructed new high tech research labs, supercomputers, and testing facilities to encourage firms to relocate their R&D operations. They have established free zones dedicated to arms manufacturing with all the range of subsidies and unique benefits that such zones typically provide. They have lured defense engineers and executives to their shores with higher salaries. They have restructured government procurement guidelines to facilitate the inward transfer of defense technologies. And they have created linkages throughout the rest of the economy, establishing defense scientific programs in their, their region's academic institutions and in its service industries. These processes not only integrate skilled Western engineers and managers into new defense partnerships established in the Middle East, but also incorporate existing domestic subcontractors and suppliers in the Arab world into the global military industrial supply chain. Many of these innovations can be traced to a complex incentive system that evolved in the late 1980s in the international arms market that was designed to assist defense firms in facilitating foreign sales. These are commonly known in defense industry parlance as offsets. Offsets are investment contracts that defense firms sign with the governments purchasing their weapon systems, designed to partially offset 
hence the term, the high cost of arms purchases, these agreements redirect capital, technology, and equipment from the defense firm back into the domestic economy of the procuring country. Increasingly, these new resources are committed to expanding indigenous military industrial manufacturing. Although defense offsets first appeared after World War II, when U.S. firms were enlisted in the rebuilding of Europe's defense industrial base, they have greatly expanded in the last two decades and have evolved into a multi-billion dollar incentive system that permeates the global arms market and extends into nearly every economic sector of the major arms procuring countries. Since the early 1990s, Western defense firms have financed a dizzying array of projects in the Middle East in an effort to sell more weapons. These projects include things like shrimp farms and petrochemical ventures in Saudi Arabia, projects to clone heritage varieties of date palms and construct naval shipyards in the UAE, the establishment of research labs and investment funds in Kuwait, personal security companies and body armor manufacturing ventures in Jordan, and a range of military, industrial, and commercial enterprises in Egypt. I argue that the impact of these defense firm financed projects in the Arab world is distinct for a number of reasons. Not only have the magnitude and complexity of these investment agreements exceeded parallel developments elsewhere in the developing world, where firms also make commitments to invest in the local economy, but offsets are also uniquely well suited to the region's prevailing mode of politics. The structure of these agreements allows regional governments to reward their domestic political allies by designating their commercial and manufacturing operations as the recipients of these investments, while also obscuring the origins of these funds. Because the defense firms incorporate the projected cost of the investment, into the prices they charge for their products. These political perks are in fact financed with the public funds of the purchasing government through the arms procurement process. But because this obfuscation serves both the material interests of the firms and the political interests of the procuring government, neither party has an incentive to reveal the truth of who actually pays for these projects. Such an arrangement harmonizes well with the current international economic environment where the triumph of economic liberalism has complicated the ability of governments to utilize more traditional overt forms of patronage and has also encouraged things like public-private partnerships and uh, joint ventures as a form of, uh, as, a better, as a better path toward development. And these projects are, of course, joint ventures in that the defense firm is often a partner and then there's a partner firm inside the procuring country. Offsets therefore work best where the purchasing government values the appearance of foreign investment and economic diversification over the increased price that they must pay for weapons acquisitions with offset arrangements, and where the procurement process is not subject to scrutiny from independent government auditors. So today I'll look at three cases of defense industrial production in the Middle East and how this is related to the defense offset system. I'm actually going to start with the UAE. So um, official figures. Uh, from Abu Dhabi site about 40 offset projects as of 2010, which is when I stopped researching my dissertation. <laughs> so uh, I'm sure there have been actually subsequent projects, but I haven't actually gotten around the, the time to um, revise that original uh, figure. Um, and they were then valued at about $2.2 billion. And about half of these projects are involved in defense-related activities. The defense-related firms operate in a range of fields including shipbuilding, the development of unmanned aerial vehicles or UAVs or drones, uh, electronic surveillance and intelligence gathering programs, operations to upgrade and modify existing military equipment, aviation technology and training companies, as well as firms that manufacture parts for military jets, munitions and small arms production, precision machining services, military logistics, armored vehicle construction, and even marketing for defense products. So this is uh, one of the first slides here. This is um, Caracal or Caracel, I don't know. It's a, it's a, it's a, a small arms manufacturer based in Abu Dhabi. They actually bought out um, the gun maker Merkel, the German firm Merkel, and then transferred all of the production lines to Abu Dhabi and then renamed the company. Um, and here's a picture of a UAV that's developed by one of the MRI firms. These projects were established through offset agreements linked to arms sales with a range of defense firms, including BAE, Northrop Grumman, Lockheed Martin, Raytheon, Finn Mechanica, Eads, and a number of other Italian and French firms. If anybody has a question, just um, 
stop me because I know sometimes it can be complicated. Or if I use like defense industry jargon, um, please feel free to, to jump in. Uh, the UAE's defense industrial strategy appears to aim at becoming a niche location for small-scale, high-tech and capital-intensive defense manufacturing and is a hub for weapons development research, such as when it financed Raytheon's newest version of the Patriot missile system. So that system um, hadn't been sold uh, to any country since uh, like 1999, it, took, it was sold to Greece. And then the UAE actually financed the next generation development of that weapon system, which then Raytheon could sell on to other third party countries. But of course the UAE got the first, um, you know, the first round of production. Because the UAE is able to leverage large financial resources in order to construct advanced facilities and provide for large R&D budgets, the Federation is a magnet for skilled defense management experts and aerospace technicians from abroad, where cuts in the defense budgets of the advanced industrial states have caused defense firms to shrink their research departments and delay development of new weapons systems. The large market for internal surveillance and policing equipment in neighboring Arab states has also helped create a uniquely auspicious environment for expanding indigenous defense production in the UAE. This market orientation is reflected in a number of initiatives pursued by the government, including the provision of costly technological infrastructure, such as the UAE's Tier 4 data center, which is one of only four in the world. Um, it essentially just processes data at an incredibly fast rate. So if you're a defense firm and you're trying to conduct um, tests on a new weapon system, um, that involves some sort of electronics, it can, the, this data center can process all of that information and spit out results much faster and more efficiently um, than a normal server. Um, and there's also, this is a picture of the uh, Saudi supercomputer, which was built a few years ago, which is similar to the, to the UAE's data center, although not as advanced or as large. Uh, the government has also opened up its universities to collaboration with defense firms, Boeing and BAE coordinate with the UAE's higher colleges of technology, regularly bringing defense executives to campus to talk to students about pursuing careers in the defense and aerospace industry, showcasing new product innovations to students in relevant disciplines, and offering internships. The defense firm Northrop Grumman and a domestic risk analysis firm that's owned by a retired Emirati Air Force general uh, co-sponsor an annual competition for these university students to design their own unmanned aerial vehicles. The winner of the Unmanned Systems Rodeo Competition, as it's called, uh, gets to present their design at the Association for Unmanned Vehicle Systems International Convention, which is held uh, every year here in DC. This is a picture of some of the student participants from one of the rodeo um, competitions. And then here is um, someone speaking at the actual the conference that's convened here in DC every year. Uh, we see similar trends in Kuwait, although these are much more limited in scale. Here, uh, offsets related to the sale of Apache helicopters involved the transfer of aircraft and marine vessel simulators uh, to the Australian College of Kuwait for use by students training to maintain and operate military equipment. The proliferation of extravagantly staged arms fairs has also led to increased interactions between representatives of private industry, military officers, civilian procurement officials, and researchers engaged in defense applications. And the Gulf states play host to many of the world's largest such gatherings, including the annual Gulf Defense and Aerospace Ex Exhibition in Kuwait, the Doha International Maritime Defense Exhibition in Qatar, and the International Defense Exhibition that's held in Abu Dhabi every year. And here's a, a photo of the, the convention floor at one of, one of the um, conventions that's held in Abu Dhabi. There's actually also an international convention on um, defense offsets which has its own entire industrial sort of structure that involves trade groups and lobby associations and, and trade fairs, and that's also actually held every year in Abu Dhabi. Uh, the pro uh, sometimes the projects established through offset agreements are more like shell companies uh, designed to funnel revenue to influential elites uh, than actual brick and mortar operations. Amirahi is one example. This firm is a joint venture created in 2009 between the Euro European Defense Consortium EADS and Emirates Inv Advanced Investments, which is a company also owned by that same retired Emirati colonel. Despite a non-existent track record of clients or projects, Emirahi was awarded a $550 million defense intelligence contract by the UAE after having been in existence for less than two years. Other indications of the company's true nature 
include MRI's efforts to recruit staff, which are actually all conducted directly by EADS through its own website. If a firm lacks the capacity to conduct an electronic job search, surely it lacks the capacity to conduct complex defense intelligence operations. So this is probably a company that exists really in name only, and it's just a way of um, finding a, a local agent that can be the partner for an investment by an overseas firm. Uh, in Jordan, the defense industrial projects are concentrated in the King Abdullah Design and Development Bureau, or the KADDB, which is the military industrial arm of the Jordanian Armed Forces, established by royal decree in 1999. This is their logo, and then this is their building, which is in downtown Amman. Um, the Bureau's website and joint press releases issued by foreign partners show at least 20 distinct product lines being jointly manufactured with defense firms and KADDB from Australia, Austria, Belgium, Canada, Italy, Germany, the Netherlands, Russia, Saudi Arabia, South Africa, South Korea, Sweden, Switzerland, Turkey, the US, the UK, and the UAE. So this isn't just a purely sort of US European um, phenomenon. There's certainly uh, firms from many other countries that engage in similar activities. <coughs> KADDB, or CADB as the locals call it, is characterized by the Jordanian government as a, quote, independent government entity within the Jordanian Armed Forces that, quote, aims to be the globally preferred partner in designing and developing defense products and security solutions in the region. Because the Jordanian defense procurement budget is much smaller than the UAE's budget, Jordanian procurement decisions are made based on which defense firms are willing to include some form of collaborative weapons production in their arms sale contract which can range from relatively low-level assembly of limited weapons components all the way up to licensed production or full-scale co-production of a large weapon system. This requirement operates as a sort of quid pro quo that uses the Jordanian defense budget as a tool to lure foreign partners into joint ventures with CADB. This tit-for-tat dynamic is visible in numerous cases where foreign defense firms that sell off the shelf or already assembled, ready to go items to Jordan are simultaneously engaged in co-production activities with CADB. When Jordan began exploring options to acquire surplus F-16s from European fleets in 2009, jets were ultimately purchased from Belgium and the Netherlands that same year. Stratagem, a logistics firm with offices in Belgium and the Netherlands, received a contract from the Dutch Agency for Economic Development to conduct feasibility studies for establishing an F-16 maintenance facility in Jordan which was then subsequently or constructed by a Dutch company called Dataless Aviation. So you can see that it's all of this sort of um, cycle of, uh, of agreements that are made between CADBI and uh, firms that are associated with the defense firm that ultimately gets the sale. Likewise, three years after Jordan purchased six Russian-made helicopters, the manufacturer of Oromprom signed an agreement with CADBI to establish an in-country assembly and maintenance facility for the helicopters. These joint ventures are possible in part because Jordan frequently purchases decommissioned or previous generation hardware on the global market, which often means the armor, mounted weapon systems, and electronics are quite old. This enables Jordan to focus on collaborating with the smaller subcontractors and suppliers that produce these systems individually before they're integrated into the final product by the large multinational tier one defense firm. A joint venture that nets the firm guaranteed future sales to the Jordanian military, geographic proximity to other regional markets, and a range of subsidies such as tax exemptions and free factory space are all significant incentives that many defense manufacturers are eager to accept. As a pro-defense industrial policy, the CADBI program has been relatively effective. CADBI's scope and scale of activities has increased dramatically since operations began just over a decade ago. As of 2011, the CADBI subsidiary Jordan Light Vehicle Manufacturing, which is a joint venture with a British company, has shipped upgraded armored vehicles to over 20 countries. CADBI companies also produce many smaller scale products, including helmets and clothing made with a patented body armor plate called Dyneema, um, which is produced by Aerospace Jordan, which itself is a joint venture with a UK company. CADBI subsidiaries also produce several types of unmanned vehicles, including backpack portable um, UAVs and patrol boats and robots designed to dismantle bombs and check for IEDs. I have a picture of the small, this is one of the sort of robot, um, IED robots. 
Uh, they also manufacture grenade launchers, sidearms, ammunition, boots, um, MREs or military field rations, numerous types of defense electronics and security related services for banks, critical infrastructure, and uh, VIP security escort services. One of its most recent innovations is the covert response vehicle, which is designed for use during periods of internal instability. And I thought this was a particularly sort of funny <laughs> picture. So this is what it looks like before, it, before you, the sides sort of fold down and all of these guns and cameras sort of like lift up out of the back of the truck. Like the Gulf states, Jordan has also capitalized on its technology partnerships to create academic linkages, such as the Prince Faisal Information Technology Center, which is in partnership with the UK's Cranfield University Defense Academy, and CADB's Electronic Systems Group, which is a partnership with Virginia's Old Dominion University. Amman has also established its own high-profile annual arms fair, the Special Operations Forces Exhibition, or SOFEX, which provides CADB with a platform for advertising its products to private sector executives and government procurement officials from around the world. As does CADB's strategic partnership with defense industry trade publications like the Jane's Defense Group publications. In addition to becoming important platforms for exchange between Jordanian Armed Forces soldiers and their foreign counterparts, these institutions also generate prestige for CADB, which is seen as augmenting its manufacturing activities with R&D efforts as well as with marketing services. And I do have some pictures. This is um, from SOFEX, the Special Operations Forces Exhibition. Um, and it's funny because all of these um, stalls that are set up by these manufacturers, you always have to be able to test out the equipment. But you obviously can't really test out the equipment. So they'll have sort of virtual reality. They'll have screens in front of them so they can see where the RPG would go. And they'll have a simulated um, target. So a lot of these pictures are pretty um, Comical. This is outside the exhibition space, um, so um, companies with large weapon systems can display those items outside. And then this is um, someone using one of those sort of simulated um, settings to test out um, an RPG. Like the UAE's focus on high-tech capital-intensive projects, Jordan has also, ha also has an exploitable niche, mainly its proximity to Iraq, a nation almost perpetually at war. CADB secured export contracts with both the U.S.-led Coalition Provisional Authority in Iraq and then subsequently the new Iraqi government. Documented exports to the CPA include 100 modernized tanks and an unspecified number of drones. Several big arms firms have also sought partnerships with CADB in order to exploit Jordan's proximity to Iraq. One clear case is ITT Industries, which is a U.S. company, which decided to collaborate with CADB on a project to refurbish U.S. military vehicles that they wanted to sell to the Iraqi army, a project that was also um, sought by the French defense giant uh, Thales. Similarly, in 2009, one year after the maritime defense firm Riverhawk, it's a US firm, set up a joint venture with CADB to build offshore support vessels, the Iraqi Navy inked a $70 million sole source contract for the exact same equipment from the exact same company. CADBI also partners with Jordanian firms that are owned by Iraqis and are therefore well placed to target Iraq's rehabilitated military as a major customer. Jordan Aerospace Industries is owned by a family whose patriarch is the grandson of the man who established Iraq's first military industrial projects in the early 20th century. Thus far, the firm has sold its small trainer and reconnaissance aircraft to both the Iraqi and the Jordanian Air Forces, and its joint venture with CADBI has produced a range of drone models that look poised for export in the future. There is also a burgeoning defense relationship between Jordan and the UAE. The Emirati conglomerate Bin Jabir Group and CADBI co-own a factory in the Dulail Industrial Park in Jordan, where their joint venture, Advanced Industries of Arabia, builds the Tiger tactical vehicle. According to the Bin Jabir Group website, the company actually supplied 500 of these vehicles to the UAE military in 2005, as well as exporting a number of the vehicles to Libya and Lebanon. Oops, I missed a part. This is important, I think, or at least interesting, I think. In addition to the marketing services on which CADB is able to draw, the Jordanian state has also provided it with many of the same supplementary services and infrastructure according to the military industrial complex in the U.S. and Europe. 
In addition to direct government funding of about $12 million a year, CADB's list of assets includes a commercial investment division staffed with finance experts that advise and evaluate potential partnerships, as well as its own industrial park with free zone status. And this is a picture of that industrial park. So it has committed infrastructure that's accessible only to companies that operate inside this industrial park. So it has probably better public services than any other location in Jordan. Um, you know, 24 hour security test on, on location test sites, catering facilities, um, its own sewage and water treatment services, and um, a range of other uh, benefits. In Egypt, defense industrial production has a much longer pedigree, and many of the long running collaborative defense production projects carried out in Egypt's military factories are in fact the legacy of efforts by the U.S., European, and Soviet governments to garner influence with the Egyptian state, and specifically the desire of the U.S. and its European allies to ensure regime, regime stability by securing the loyalty of the armed forces. To date, the largest weapons projects in Egypt have included manufacturing tanks and other armored vehicles, the overhaul of engines for major weapon systems like tanks and aircraft, producing components for the F-16 under the Peace Vector program, and the Hawk missile rebuilding programs, as well as the domestic manufacture of numerous smaller items like night vision equipment, periscopes, machine guns, tank ammunition, and battlefield electronics that are also produced under license from foreign firms. Despite its overwhelming reliance on U.S. military assistance funds for its procurement budget, excluding, of course, the present influx of Gulf money, um, which no one knows what they're spending that on. But Egypt has also managed to secure cooperative production agreements with nine U.S. defense firms. Most recently, the Egyptian military has secured agreements to produce Chinese fighter jets, Turkish naval vessels, and Pakistani jet trainers, while continuing to utilize U.S. military aid to construct factories for maintaining and overhauling many components of its large weapons arsenal. Indeed, defense manufacturing and exports appear to be increasing in importance to the Egyptian armed forces leadership in the years immediately preceding Mubarak's ouster. A 2010 report from the U.S. Embassy in Cairo showed that technology transfer requests from the Egyptian Armament Authority were increasing considerably, signaling the General's desire to expand the export of military manufactured weapons that contained U.S. Uh, technology, including potential sales of tanks to Iraq and ammunition to Saudi Arabia, as well as the provision of technical support for Turkey's arsenal of Hawk missiles. During the same period, um, Egyptian Armed Forces officials also requested permission to give tours of military production facilities to officials from Iraq and Tunisia. And the Egyptian military's reassertion of formal power over the institutions of the state have only made it a more attractive economic partner. In 2008, the U.S. firm Swift Ship signed a $13 million contract to sell four off-the-shelf ready-made patrol craft to the Egyptian Navy. But then in February 2011, the very same month that Mubarak stepped down, the contract was revised to allow an Egyptian shipyard to assemble two of the patrol craft and to co-produce the other two. So assembly, you just put the parts together. Um, Co-production is a much more intensive process. There's much more technology transfer and there's much more training of the personnel necessary required to build it at an increased contract cost of $20 million. Later that year, a Turkish company, uh, Yanka Onuk, signed an agreement with Egypt to manufacture six of its armed patrol boats at the Egyptian military shipyard in Alexandria. Such conditions entail a significant amount of technology transfer and frequently include the construction of new facilities, the import of additional capital equipment, long-term contracts for spare parts and repairs, and new personnel training. Many of these armed sales agreements also generate access to new investment equipment, technology, and facilities that the Egyptian military can use to produce non-defense goods that it then sells on the domestic market. A 2005 agreement to co-produce 120 Chinese jets at the military's aircraft factory came with an increased contract price about 25% higher than an off-the-shelf purchase would have been. But it also coincided with the construction of a brand new production facility now churning out Chinese-designed air conditioning units at the military's Helwan Metallic Appliances Company. And I have some pictures of that. So if you've ever been in an Egyptian military factory, most of them don't look like that. <laughs> they have one guy sort of wandering around looking for something to um, drill. And this was like a brand new, very, very, very nice facility. 
here's another uh, picture with no, with no one working. In addition, the state-owned Chinese oil company Sinopec recently launched two joint ventures with one of the public sector companies in which the Ministry of Military Production has a significant minority holding, the Fadawa Petroleum Company. In 2009, Egypt awarded a contract to a Ukrainian state-owned armaments company to overhaul 400 of Egypt's tanks and amphibious armored personnel carriers. In exchange, the Ukrainian manufacturer agreed to transfer technologies to the military's Abu Zabal tank factory and the Cotter factory for developed industries. Similar arrangements exist with U.S. companies as well. The Egyptian Armed Forces assembles three different models of military-grade Chrysler Jeeps at, at the Ministry of Military Production's Arab American Vehicle Factory, and then also sells civilian versions of that same uh, Jeep on the domestic market. And two of the military models, which are exclusively produced at that factory in Egypt, have been exported to over two dozen countries, including Libya, where these, tent, where these jeeps were deployed by pro-government forces during skirmishes with protesters in Tripoli. And here's a picture of the, um, of the jeep that's produced in Egypt. And then here's a picture of that same jeep that was exported to Libya, actually in Tripoli. So clearly, uh, the financial interests of these defense firms and their increasing independence from the strictures of host state priorities are fundamentally reshaping the global defense industrial supply chain. But the globalization of military production has also been catalyzed by the persistent increase in state subsidies that regional <coughs> governments are willing to commit to arms development and production. That these subsidies have the fortunate side effect of bolstering the business operations of traditional regime allies is an added bonus. Unscrupulous arms dealers and third world dictators are often depicted in an instrumental relationship of symbiosis. The former reaps a financial premium by supplying the latter with the weapons it needs to suppress dissent and maintain power. But in today's complex global economy, this typology obscures the sophisticated contractual exchanges that have come to define the contemporary contemporary relationship between defense firms and their customers. Defense firms are no longer in the business of merely selling weapons. They are also a major source of influence in the domestic economies of major arms procuring countries. The wide variety of projects that these arms transactions fund, alternately characterized as efforts to achieve economic diversification and industrial modernization, in fact belies their common utility as a domestic political tool. Just as weapons caches are a tool in the authoritarian arsenal, so too are the offset investments made through regional arms sales, which provide a new reservoir of financial and material resources that corrupt regimes use to maintain and expand their domestic support networks. That's it. Way under, 35 minutes. Thank you. Thank you. Should I stay up here for questions? Or? Yeah, so, uh, we have uh, plenty of time for questions from the floor. Joseph, do you want to start us off? Hi, thank you for your uh, presentation. So all those countries spent a lot of money on defense, and I guess it's really a different question why they are doing it. So UAE, in the last 12, 14 years, probably spent on average $10 billion mm -hmm. a year. So. Listening to you, if anything, my art wouldn't the argument be if you are deciding to spend so much money on armament, and that's really a separate question, which is not what you're trying to analyze. Isn't it better to have a domestic defense? You know, I understand you're saying it's economically maybe not. Uh, a straightforward because it involves subsidies and it's a political tool. But to me, hearing about three different examples and whether they are importing it from France or the US or Germany or China and straight into UAE or Jordan or Egypt versus some kind of production which actually, if anything, sometimes you're saying it has impact on the local production for non-military, if anything, they should be congratulated. Yeah. Um, I mean, in the case of, so in the case of Egypt, I would say it is quasi-beneficial that 
Chrysler and these different um, sort of very large automobile manufacturing companies actually, which oftentimes have sort of military sides of their business operations, um, actually end up transferring equipment and um, technology and um, personnel and spare parts to these factories where they can then build just regular passenger vehicles. They also build construction uh, equipment and ambulances and really a, a wide range of um, sort of large uh, items like that. The question, I guess, is then what does the military do with the money, right? I mean, because it's not going into the general budget. It's not like they're exporting these items and then the revenues from those operations go into the you know, the public funds. I mean, I think they're, they're keeping these revenues just to do with them whatever they choose, either bailing out the Egyptian Central Bank or, um, you know, spending it on, they upped salaries of a lot of the junior level officers at the beginning of the uprising to sort of win them over, to co-op them. Uh, you know, they buy up real estate and villas and stuff. So it depends, I guess, on what the companies do with the revenues. Uh, in the case of the UAE, actually the money that the added cost of an off, of an arms purchase with an offset contract is exponential. So I spoke with a couple people who work in the industry and they said that generally the amount, the value of the investment that the defense firm makes is around 5% of the extra charge that they add on to the purchase agreement. So the UAE, for every $5 million that it gets in technology or capital equipment or whatever else, it's actually paying $95 million for that, when it could actually buy it on the open market much cheaper. But then it wouldn't look like these companies are choosing to invest in the UAE. These <coughs> projects actually get recorded officially as foreign direct investment. Right? So when the UAE and Saudi Arabia can say, look at all of this mass you know, influx of foreign direct investment we had last year, but it's actually just because these defense firms are essentially like forced into these arrangements. And even then, the government is paying a huge premium to get that investment. So what they really presumably should be doing is just trying to get foreign companies to invest in Saudi Arabia and the UAE absent these sort of additional um, strictures. It's, I mean, it's just sort of a, I mean, it's really just sort of a facade because it's not actually, it's not the way that, uh, it's not the way that you would traditionally think of as, as foreign direct investment operating in an economy. So it doesn't suggest that they're actually advancing or modernizing or diversifying. And I'm not sure that there are a lot of linkages. Some of the linkages, of course, are, like in Kuwait, there's a, a company called Agility, which uh, was, I think, sort of founded during the first uh, Gulf War as like a catering and logistics service. Um, and it's gotten so many uh, subcontracts from uh, defense firms operating in the region that now it's I think one of the a few years ago during the second Iraq war it was it was one of the largest defense firms in the world according to the Stockholm International Peace Research Institute because it had so many contracts with the US military. So you have the I mean you have cases like that but it was also um, engaged in a lot of corrupt activities and the people have brought suit against the company about a range of of things and the, and the people that are benefiting from that are not necessarily ordinary Kuwaitis. They're probably, you know, Pakistanis and Filipinos that are working in these um, very low-level service jobs and are getting terrible wages and are having their passports seized and, you know, spending the night in containers that are, you know, not fit for human habitation. So, does that sort of answer the question? Yeah, if, can I, may I follow sure. up with, I mean, so in, from an economic point of view, you're saying it's better to just import rather than to try to produce it locally in the way that it has been done. I mean, no one produces anything locally, right? I mean, even a, even a US um, weapon system 
has components in it from literally thousands of subcontractors, um, many of which are overseas. And even those overseas subcontractors also have foreign suppliers. So no country in the world um, is sort of self-sufficient um, in the production of defense technologies. So, I mean, and the, the extent to which it has sort of uh, over, spillover effects into the civilian economy, I think, is when people make that argument, it's it, because if you, I mean, there's a, there's a huge literature on actually how ineffective and inefficient it is to subsidize defense production. If you actually subsidize civilian production, it would, you would get the same outcome for a much lower cost. So. I was wondering if I could ask you, kind of building on that discussion, I mean, this is kind of a bewildering array of different offset agreements and joint ventures, and there's a whole bunch of hidden stuff going on. It's, I was wondering what you think the kind of underlying logic is, because I could see different explanations emerging. There's one explanation as in Egypt it might be to do with the Egyptian army getting the funds it needs to maintain some kind of institutional autonomy to be a player. There's also something about crony capitalism or how liberalizing authoritarian regimes can spread the spoils amongst their mm -hmm. friends. There's also something about subsidizing international business or yeah. Western companies. And there's also something about how the US in Iraq was able to use these kind of local defense industries in Jordan to get you know, cheaper ammunition or whatever it needed. So I was wondering, what do you think is the kind of, I mean, there may not be one underlying logic, but how do we understand this kind of bewildering complexity of different activities. I'm, well, the, the real driver of this has been uh, the defense firms, actually, um, because they want to promote these agreements, because they reap a significant financial benefit from it, because they jack up the price of these products so much, and then the amount of money that they actually have to expend to satisfy these arrangements is extremely low. It used to be, uh, for U.S. companies at least, that um, the U.S. government was um, on the hook for fulfilling an offset contract if uh, the defense firm um, defaulted on that arrangement. But because these agreements became so complex and large, the U.S. government essentially just said, um, you know, you're on your own with this even though it was originally designed as a U.S. government program to help subsidize uh, U.S. defense exports. But then it became so complicated and so large and so, so spread out that, that the U.S. government actually not only sort of removed itself entirely from the process, but actually ceased to keep any sort of data um, on the agreements that are concluded by these firms, uh, essentially because a lot of smaller suppliers and subcontractors in the U.S. were complaining that their jobs were being outsourced to uh, production lines in other countries where they were producing the smaller components that would go into these uh, large um, defense systems. Right, so what may have been produced um, at a production, at an assembly line in Ohio to go into a tank is now being produced in India or in Malaysia or in Egypt or in South Korea or in uh, any, any number of places. And so these small sort of manufacturers association lobby groups actually um, really raised hell in Congress in the mid-1990s saying you can't keep doing this anymore. And so and all of the statistics that they were citing were from U.S. government reports that had been compiled by the uh, the General Accounting Office and lots of other sort of independent auditing agencies within the U.S. government. And to keep that from happening, the U.S. government just sort of stopped actually allowing these agencies to collect any of this information. So you used to have um, the Bureau of Industry and Security released a report every year about all these offset arrangements, um, the value of them, which countries they went to, um, and a range of other um, indicators. And now all the Bureau of Industry and Security does is actually come up, is actually publish one single figure, which is the value of all U.S. defense offsets without identifying the country, um, the type of offset, or the U.S. defense firm that actually enters into the arrangement. That way it's much more difficult for um, local sort of unions and machinists unions and, and manufacturers, small manufacturers associations to actually target those programs publicly. So, I mean, it's really, it's, it's, in, it's definitely in the financial interests of these firms 
to continue with these projects. Every once in a while, there's an analyst, um, you know, a defense industry analyst that will come out and say, look, we're not paying for this. These preparing country governments are paying for this. Um, but it's very rarely um, repeated in sort of industry publications or in congressional hearings where industry officials may have to give, uh, um, may have to testify about the programs. I mean, it's really, they try to keep a very tight lid on the actual process itself. answer now, but I was wondering, uh, two of the cases that you've chosen are major recipients of U.S. aid. Is that entering into the equation? And my second question would be, I would be interested to see how the, these new military complexes are sold internally, domestically. Is it more uh, from an economic perspective, trying to reap you know, financial benefits, or is the security dimension prevailing? In, in the state's interaction? In terms of what they decide to Deciding try to produce to domestically? Yes. Um, so, so, yeah, so in terms of the military assistance issue, um, in the mid-1980s, uh, Egypt and Israel um, and Turkey and Greece, um, when they were the almost really the only recipients of U.S. military assistance, and they all had very robust um, offset programs. So if a firm sold anything to any of those countries, those countries demanded very um, sophisticated sort of uh, offset arrangements that would transfer substantial amounts of production um, into those countries, which is why Turkey and Israel today have very advanced um, domestic defense industries, uh, most of which are built on US defense technologies that were transferred under uh, offset arrangements in the 60s and 70s. Um, and now actually compete with U.S. defense exports. So there was a few Congress persons um, who actually brought this before, actually proposed a bill that would prohibit any country that received U.S. military assistance from demanding uh, offsets in, in addition to the mil their sort of free military equipment. Um, Israel got an, an exemption, uh, just a blanket exemption, uh, and. Egypt sort of just stopped calling it an offset, right? So, in in none of the in none of the uh, Bureau of Industry and Security reports or the Office of Management and Budget, which was also historically required to record uh, data on these agreements, uh, Egypt actually never shows up, even though co-production, uh, licensed production, and co-development is by definition an offset. The U.S. government just sort of never called it never sort of designated it as an offset. So, and the Egyptians won't sort of, won't actually demand that. It's just, it, it's just that if you, you know if you want to sell to this country, you actually will, be, you will have to transfer some sort of production there. It's like an unwritten rule, which is the same way in Jordan. So Jordanian defense officials will say, no, we don't have an offset program, but if you want to sell us something, you need to establish some sort of tertiary investment uh, project here that either has something to do with that defense equipment, like a maintenance, repair, and overhaul uh, facility, or an upgrade, some other sort of upgrade facility, or you need to establish some sort of um, manufacturing facility for a different sort of uh, defense material. So they don't technically call it offsets, and that's how they actually get away with it in terms of not violating U.S. policy. So, I mean, it's not a good answer, but that's actually, it's sort of been documented. Like, you have Jordanian defense officials that will admit to the fact that this is the way the system works, and this is how things operate, so. Um, your second question was, oh, deciding what to produce domestically? I mean, in some sense, it's determined by what they purchase, right? So if they purchase a helicopter um, as an arms uh, as an arms purchase, then they'll def they'll establish some sort of facility that produces like a rotary blade or some part that goes into that helicopter. So in that sense, it is sort of determined by their what they see as their strategic imperative. 
Um, but for Jordan also, they want to build things that they can sell um, regionally. So they'll focus on you know, surveillance technologies and other sorts of internal security um, items and then try to produce those domestically. It's not that they don't use them themselves for their own sort of internal surveillance, um, but they want something that they can, they can generate exports as well. So, so my question was more specifically, is it more the rationale domestically, is it more leaning towards the economic dimension or is the security um, discourse more important in the sense like there is, like you mentioned for Jordan, the fact of having Iraq as a neighboring state. Is that really what is so domestically as potential I mean, threat and justifying yeah. the, these you know, <coughs> domestic productions? I mean, I talked to someone who was involved with the establishment of CADBI at the very early stages, um, and his uh, philosophy was, look, we need to develop an entire uh, defense industrial base in Jordan so that we can provide jobs for military engineers and earn export mm -hmm. revenue. Uh, so he wanted to produce sort of very low tech um, items that would have a large export market that they could sort of undercut other producers, um, things that are you know, not very technologically sophisticated but that they could still find a regional market for. Of course, the Gulf states buy things, I think, from CADBI as a, as a subsidy in much the same way that they've um, sort of subsidized the Jordanian government in the past. Um, with direct loans and grants. So that also becomes sort of part of the dynamic. Um, they also, I think, I mean, no one will say, they, they, they certainly, couch, the Jordanians certainly couch it in, um, in economic discourse uh, rather than a security discourse. But uh, the Emiratis, you know, talk about diversification and, and establishing and some sort of industrial base where there wasn't before. Uh, the Egyptians, of course, talk about strategic self-sufficiency as if that's ever going to happen. Like they're, you know, they they talk about how much of the actual machine they build completely themselves, right? So they they assemble 94% of the M1A1 Abrams tank domestically, um, which they see as more of a strategic goal than an economic goal, partly because they've never been able to actually export anything. <laughs> Um, or not anything of, of significance to not in order to generate revenue, but they sell civilian goods on the domestic market for money. So when they're producing military goods, the, the justification can't really be economic, it has to be strategic. So it's different, I think, for different countries. Um, you didn't talk much about Saudi Arabia, and Saudi Arabia certainly has one of the largest uh, defense uh, budget in the region. Uh, do you think that there the phenomenon of this offset program is as prevalent as in the case of Egypt and Jordan, or yeah. much more limited? Um, actually, Saudi Arabia was the first country in the region to actually have a formalized offset policy, um, which started in the early 1980s. Uh, and there was the, the Peace Shield program, which was a massive um, uh, arms sale agreement with uh, dozens of U.S. Uh, defense firms. And they established a number of uh, facilities in Saudi Arabia, like the Al Salam mm -hmm. Aircraft Company. There's the um, Advanced Electronics Company. There's the Middle East Battery Company. There's a, actually a lot of these companies in Saudi Arabia. But the Saudis sort of didn't, they didn't guarantee contracts to any of these operators, so they weren't buying the stuff that these places were producing. Um, actually, they had a law that actually prohibited the procurement of domestic, of defense material from domestic companies until just about two years ago. Um, so the companies essentially like folded, really. Um, and then after that, they, they shifted their focus much more toward civilian offset projects. So they have a lot of aquaculture, um, mostly stuff on the coast, so you know, bracket, saline, you know, saline tolerant forms of um, sea life. And I think they also have like tilapia, massive tilapia farms that were financed by you know, French defense firms. They have a lot of investment funds. Uh, which are essentially sovereign wealth funds that are um, uh, financed with um, 
money from offset arrangements, which of course is ridiculous because it's money that the Saudis give to the French defense firm that the French defense firm then gives a little bit back to the Saudis and the Saudis invest it in their own sovereign wealth funds. So it's sort of this ridiculous cycle where you know money is sloughed off when they pass it from the you know, from the um, arms purchase agreement and goes back into the investment fund. Uh, they have lots of different um, commercial sort of civilian operations, but not a lot of uh, defense specific operations, at least not as much as in the UAE. But I think they're actually trying to get back into it. So they, when they bought the recent tranche of Typhoon jets from uh, BAE, uh, they actually requested that half of those planes be assembled in Saudi Arabia and that was the condition of the contract for like two years and then all of a sudden they just sort of dropped that requirement um, at the last minute. So now they're all being um, fully assembled and produced in the UK and then shipped over as finished products to Saudi Arabia. So it seems like they're trying to, the Saudis are trying to sort of divert, trying to go that direction with their offsets but they're not having as much success as the Emiratis are. Can I have a follow-up question? Sure. Uh, so uh, I am a little bit confused. Um, would you be happy if I go out from this room and say what I got away from this conference is that these big defense firms are taking these countries for a ride? Yeah, that's exactly what it is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's perfect, yeah. No, that's exactly what it is. I well, I, uh, I don't. I, uh. Yeah, like they weren't doing that before, right? Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, yeah. Yeah. So I mean, I think that the the, the sort of the takeaway is that these um, countries are now using the fact that they're they're taking the opportunity to make it look like they are establishing um, domestic industries and commercial projects and manufacturing operations and joint ventures and public-private partnerships um, using investment from foreign sources. Because in Saudi Arabia and the UAE and Kuwait, it's not about finding money. It's about convincing international investors or, and, and international banks and the international community that what you're doing with your economy is actually you're being a good steward of your economy. And that's really the basis for the legitimacy of these regimes, right? Unless, you're, unless you think it's because People think they're devout and pious Muslims, which I don't think the majority of their populations believe. They actually, they assent to sort of the rule of these monarchs because they think that thus far they haven't been terrible managers of the economy. So the fact that they're getting all of these um, new businesses established with the partnership of these defense firms actually makes it look like they're modernizing the economy, they're diversifying the economy, they're trying to find jobs establish industries to provide jobs for people, even though this is an inefficient way of doing that, and it's actually an extremely costly way for them to do that. Could I ask just uh, following on this, uh, your point, but what, you, what, what I take away from the talk, um, and let me see, I don't want to put words in your mouth, so let me phrase what I see as be two kind of implications and see if I've got it right. Because I think what you do in this talk is kind of undermine two myths. One is that these defense companies, you know, private sector companies, are incredibly efficient or competitive, um, kind of the leading lights of you know, particular you know, technological industries. Actually, they're just relying on state subsidies in order to make that profit. So you got a, you're kind of problematizing this, uh, the distinction between the private sector and the, and the state on the one hand. And also, I think what you do is... Um, undermine some of the myths about globalization, which is supposed to be all about the spread of you know, international private sector capital. But again, we've got the essential role of the state. So we've got, because the state is the incubator for these uh, enterprises, it's actually reinserting, you know, globalization is supposed to be about the erosion of the state and the retreat to the state. But I think what this, these case studies show is quite the opposite, that the state is actually essential and very much involved with the deepening of globalization of the of the defense industries. Yeah, the state being, right, the shift from subsidies provided by American and European governments to subsidies being provided by Gulf and um, other developing world governments, right? Yeah, so, I mean, the fact that 
European and American defense budgets and subsidies to the defense industry declined at the same time that these offset agreements skyrocketed, I don't think is a coincidence. Because these firms know that they have to um, find new sources of financial support, and this was this has evolved into a very easy way for them to make a lot of money. So I think that's that's the perfect evaluation case. Okay. Sorry, but but going back to my first question, there is already a decision taken. I mean. Why does the UAE spend on average ten billion dollars I mean, when they really can't use this? You know, when you order 40, 50 of these sophisticated jets, it's impossible to really use, and a lot of it did go into commissions and fees and bribes. I mean, with countries like France, it's not even under the table. It's, it's all. Yeah. Yeah. Official. Are terrible. And a lot of people <laughs> made huge amounts of money. So I go back and say, I'm, I understand what you're saying about the defense companies, but the first decision was, let's say a country like you <coughs> made a decision, we want to spend a huge amount for whatever reason. Mm -hmm. And we are really not talking why they want to do that. Yeah, yeah, and they'll also buy redundant equipment, right? So the Saudis will buy F-16s, and then they'll buy the European version of the F-16 which is completely illogical because the two systems are incommensurate and you can't use the same technicians to, to um, fix them, you can't use the same spare parts, you have to train people on two different weapons platforms, which is extremely costly. So really the reason that the, I think that the Saudis um, and other Gulf governments do that is because it's a form of diplomacy with the U.S. and um, European governments, right, is that we'll buy this stuff from you, you continue to provide a regional security um, arrangement that, that has existed for decades, and then this just this cycle just continues, which is why they have all of this equipment that they could never possibly deploy in, in a regional theater situation. So, And of course, it does make a lot of money for a lot of very well-connected people who are often the same people that actually make the decisions, of course, about what equipment to buy, um, which is why you'll see um, like in the case of the UAE, there's this um, official who has established a lot of joint ventures with um, only French and Italian firms, right? Because he's probably the one that told the, the Emirati government to buy this French and Italian equipment, right? And so then he gets uh, the benefits of establishing uh, joint ventures with French and Italian companies. And you'll see that people sort of stick with you're, you know, you're either bought by the Americans or you're bought by the Europeans um, in that respect. And the, yeah, the Europeans actually are much more open about sort of bri bribing people. <laughs> it's not even considered bribery. Yeah, I mean, like insider trading isn't even illegal in Germany, right? It's like that, of course, that's how you trade stocks. How else would you decide what stock to buy, right? You have to have inside information. They operate on inside so information. So finders fee. Yeah, right. Yeah, so the. Yeah, I mean, they're, they after the Al Yamama scandal with the UK with the BAE, they I think that the British are sort of trying to attempt to make it look like they might eventually one day prosecute someone for corruption <laughs> related to defense sales. But I mean, no one's gone to jail yet. I don't think so. And that was that. Was, I mean, they kept receipts for the bribes, you know. So <laughs> I mean, they documented them. They have the evidence. They just, of course, the Saudis said they'll stop cooperating with the British on, on counterterrorism operations, so that they dropped the suit, so. We have time for a last question. Anyone would like to? Uh... Are, are, like Jordan and UAE, are they selling any of this stuff anywhere? Uh... Yeah, yeah, um, Cadby actually has sold, uh, has made a lot of export um, agreements um, for a range of items. Actually, that, that body armor venture that they have has been so successful that they actually have an offset of arrangement of their own because it was bought by, I think, Romania. Um, and then the Romanians were like, well, if we're going to buy this body armor from you, you need to manufacture some of it here. So the Jordanian, actually, the CAD, that venture has been so successful that now they're, they're actually on the hook for these, um, these uh, domestic arrangements with their uh, purchasing partners. So. Um, 
Yeah, the UAE, I think it's been, the UAE, the car carousel gun is actually the sidearm that's used by all of, I think, for all or most of the police and internal security services in the Gulf countries is that gun that's produced in the UAE, so they've been fairly successful with that too. And of course, everyone loves drones. Drones are a big item, so those have been fairly successful exports. Okay, in that case, um, I would like to, before we thank our speaker, invite you to join us for some light refreshments outside um, to keep away the chill of the winter. Um, but I'd like to, I often point out, my students are probably sick of me pointing out that um, for scholars of the Middle East, we don't do a lot of work about the military or about war. Um, and this seems to be a curious absence in the study of contemporary politics, given how essential it is. So I'm delighted um, that Shane, you were able to give us such an um, insightful um, kind of window on this world which is hidden and murky. Um, full of corruption. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.